y'all. Welcome to another episode of 9-11 was an inside job and with me is Marcella Pena and uh, we're going to uh, try to give you some interesting stuff today. I'm going to start out right away with a video and we'll come back and give you a little more discussion in a second. This video is about So yesterday it was released that a paid informant for the NYPD was under orders to quote, bait Muslims into saying inflammatory things. Yep, Shamir Raham, a 19 year old Bangladeshi American, con conducted a double life, taking pictures inside of mosques and collecting the names of people attending study groups on Islam. Police reportedly told Shamir to embrace a strategy called create and capture. He said it involved creating conversations about jihad or terrorism, then capturing their responses. And for his hard, commendable work here, he's earned $1,000 a month. And of course, some goodwill on a string of minor marijuana arrests. RT had the chance to talk to Cyrus McGoldrick, a rep from the Council on American Islamic Relations. And here's what he had to say about it. I noticed something in the article today that was especially disturbing and that he was really recording not just to get people in plots and plans but to just get people to say something that was somehow inflammatory or that somehow controversial and that that speech was enough for the NYPD to keep tabs on. That for me is a whole new level of, of, of totalitarianism and something that we should all be conscious of. He's right. No need for real substance just as long as they've got some anti-American sentiment. You know, this all reminds me of another recent story, that of Quasi Mohammed Renwazel, a Bangladeshi American who was just arrested for his plot to bomb the Federal Reserve Building, but not without the help of the FBI, of course. You see, Rizal just became a statistic in a string of countless other FBI foiled plots. And it was Glenn Greenwald who so perfectly called out this entrapment. He said the FBI concocts a terrorist attack, infiltrates Muslim communities in order to find recruits, persuades them to perpetrate the attack, supplies them with the money, weapons, and the know-how they need to carry it out, only to heroically jump in at the last moment, arrest the would-be perpetrators whom the FBI converted, and save a grateful nation from the plot manufactured by the FBI. Don't you get it, folks? All of this is in part a huge campaign to make the U.S. look like they've saved America from the terrorist plots that they have set themselves have created. It's absurd. With no real threat facing this country, the FBI and CIA need to invent reasons to justify the domestic front of the war on terror. But I want to bring it back to the Muslim American community, because this is a community that's now suffering to levels comparable to what we saw with anti-Japanese sentiment post-World War II. And instead of internment camps, we've just moved into a debilitating state of Muslim surveillance. Think about it. We don't need to intern people to monitor them anymore. We just have massive surveillance grids set up to spy on the people that the U.S. would have probably put into camps 50 years ago. This is all the new chilling effect, chilling Muslim Americans into a continuum of isolation and trepidation, pushing them into a fear of one of their most sacred tenets, their mosque. Because you see, it's a problem when your place of worship has been completely hijacked by the incessant worry that you might mistakenly befriend an informant, or even worse, that your mild dissent for U.S. foreign policy will somehow distort into a justification for your arrest. You see, that is not freedom of religion. That is not freedom of speech. So that is where the U.S. principles for democracy were thrown out the window and were replaced with institutionalized fear. You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com All right, we're back again. And uh, I guess um, 
you have an announcement about the uh, December event? Um, yes. Well, if they can actually put it up on the screen for the actual dates. I don't think we're going to be able okay. to do that. Okay. Um, well, I in December, uh, so I'm I'm with the uh, with the Portland chapter of Architects and Engineers for 9/11 Truth, and in December we're going to have a two-day event. You can go to our web www.portlandae, which stands for Architects and Engineers, portlandae 911truthorg for the actual dates and location. The location will be in Northeast, but it's going to be a two-day event. The first day we're going to be showing a video, and the second day we're going to be discussing um, the loss of our civil, our civil liberties, um, how we feel about what we saw in the video, and it's really meant to be a, a two-day solution-based event. Um, we've been offering free library presentations of the video that we'll be showing on the first day uh, since June, and we've been going to multiple locations in multiple cities, and and um, we did one event in 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 Gresham in October, and um, anyway, our next event will be in December, and it's a two-day event, and um, maybe later in the program they'll be able to put up on the screen. Um, the two-day event, but again, you can please go to our website, it, which is www.portlandae911truth.org, and again, it's for a two-day event, and uh, the film that we'll be screening on the first day is entitled, it actually, it just came out, the latest version, and again, this is with Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, it's their latest video, and the, the edition came out in May, and it's called 9-11 Explosive Evidence, Experts Speak Out, and so we'll be showing that um, on the first day, um, both um, our, our two-day event is is a weekday, and uh, is on weekdays, and so we'll be showing it in the evenings on on weekdays, and it's it's really about two and a half hours each day, one for the viewing of the film, and and Q and A there immediately, and then the next day as a solution-based workshop. So please consider um, please consider attending and go to our website. Okay, uh, in the control room, would you put my computer in the background? I've got some announcements on it, uh, the full background. Well, I, I don't know if anybody can read that. Uh, yeah, there you go. Now, take off the DVE3, I mean, key 3. There you go. Okay, uh, well, I told you last show about a noble lie which was the two-hour documentary about the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing, which now we know also was an inside job because of planted explosives. Um, I've gotten permission to broadcast that, and we have the broadcast schedule for you right now. You might want to jot this down if you have a pencil. Um, the Noble Lie, the first one is Sunday, 11-11, at 8.30 on Channel 22, then Wednesday, 11.14 at 11.30 p.m. on Channel 23, Monday, 11.19 at 10 p.m. Channel 23, and Wednesday, 11.21 at 9 p.m. Channel 22. Now that's the noble lie. Now we have two others. Uh, I, one of them's being partially obscured by... I'll, I'll Marcella, out of the yeah, way. there you go. Okay, sorry about that. No, yeah, we're okay. really top quality <laughs> engineering here, right? Uh, but anyway, the next two are by James Corbett, and he's another person who graciously gave me permission to not only broadcast his shows, but to post them on YouTube on my channel. So uh, the first one he, that we were doing is it's already queued up for, uh, let's see, November 12th, Monday. It's called Remembering 9-11, the James Corbett Report. Uh, 11 p.m. Channel 23 on Monday, 11-12, I mean. Friday, 11-16 at 7 p.m. Channel 22. And the following Tuesday, at uh, November 20th at 10 p.m. Channel 22. And Wednesday, November 21 at 9.30 p.m. Channel 23. Now, they're all in the evening, and they're kind of scattered around. Um, there were no Channel 11 broadcasts on any of these, so some people won't get to see them. But I will be posting them. Well, they're already on the internet if you want to see them. But the the goodie that's already played a couple times, and it, we have a ongoing event right now with fluoride in Portland, and uh, James Corbett put out in his Corbett report, and it'll be coming up soon. Portland versus fluoride. Now James Corbett's a uh, a journalist from Japan. He's based in Japan, but anyway. 
those have four showings. Um, two of them are already gone, so I'll just tell you the last two. Coming up uh, November 7th, Wednesday at 8 p.m. on Channel 23, and Friday, 11, 9, at 7 o'clock on Channel 23. So it's really good news about it turns out that when you ask people for permission, in, unless they're C-SPAN, they'll probably give you the permission. There are lots of others who won't too, but I called up C-SPAN to ask if I could play one of their clips, and uh, they sent me back this kind of a hogwash letter saying, uh, no, we, we don't want to do that because we don't want our viewers to become confused when they see C-SPAN on a cable access channel. Well, uh, you know, treat me like an adult, please. I wrote him back saying, come on, just say you got economic considerations and don't pretend that you have so little respect for your own viewers that you think they get confused when they see something on cable access. My God, I mean, have some respect for yourself when you write something. Anyway, uh, I guess... Uh, what I need to do is set up the next clip here so that we can... Uh, see if I can set a little bit aside. Let me see here if I can... Go ahead and put up the uh, other... Oh, man, I'm trapped. I'm so happy that you're going to be showing these. That's fantastic. Good job. That's fantastic. Definitely going to watch these myself. It would have been nice to have all the all this arranged ahead of time but what I've got is one another uh, Russia Today clip and the lady that we are watching is Abby Martin I mean even though this is Russia Today it's based in Washington DC the people that you see on the show are full Americans they're just as patriotic as you and I and you know luckily we're over that communism anti-communism war stuff you know the yeah. red scare so now yeah. we don't have to Absolutely. pretend that Anything we hear them say is no good. It turns out that what they say is far, far more meaningful and truthful than any other broadcast in the United States, bar none. And I challenge you to prove me wrong. Anyway, that's why I like this so much. I was so pleased when they said I could uh, rebroadcast it. Now, this one's about a 10-minute 10, 10 one, and we'll use that time while you're watching to uh, actually... Uh, organize ourselves a little better. <laughs> so let's talk about something that's time and again being left out of the conversation, voter fraud. And no, I'm not talking about voting under someone else's identity. Rather, I'm talking about the actual rigging of the elections and outright manipulation of voting machines. Take this for example. Ohio Secretary of State John Husted has skirted around election laws to install experimental software patches on vote counting tabulators in up to 39 Ohio counties. So. What are these uncertified software patches? And could they have the potential to alter the election results? Those are the things we need to be asking in this pivotal election. So to help us break through the madness, I'm joined now by Mark Crispin Miller, professor of media at NYU and author of Fooled Again, The Real Case for Electoral Reform. Mark, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me on. I, I, I fled to Brooklyn from Manhattan in order to have flushing toilets and electricity. So, uh, you know, I'd ordinarily be in the studio, but I couldn't do that today. No problem. We really appreciate it. I know things are really crazy over there in New York. So, you know, Mark, last time we talked, um, we talked mostly about the last uh, the last couple of elections and the extensive voting fraud with those. Let's talk about this election. I mean, going off what I just said, what do you think about these new software patches that are going to be installed? Well, they're, it's very alarming, uh, and that's not the only story like that. One story that has gotten a surprising amount of media attention also has to do with Ohio and the Romney campaign uh, through a closely held uh, hedge fund uh, called Solomir. Uh, Mitt Romney's family, that is he, his wife, his brother, and his son Tag, uh, are major majority in investors in HIG Capital. And HIG Capital owns uh, Heart InterCivic, which makes voting machines uh, machines that will be used to count the votes in two populous Ohio counties, uh, Hamilton and Williams, Hamilton County being where Cincinnati is. So in essence, what we have is uh, voting machines made by a company that has uh, three out of five of its board members from HIG Capital 
These are Romney fundraisers with a controlling interest in a, in, a, in, a, in a company that will help to count the vote on election day in a state where the election has historically been stolen already by Republicans. This is so shocking that it has actually helped to push this long suppressed story into the mainstream, even Fox 19. The, the Fox-owned news station in Cincinnati did a terrific report on this, while the New York Times and others, as usual, have, have ignored it. But this is, as you say in your intro, precisely the kind of thing that people should be paying attention to, regardless of, of their party affiliation or even if they have no party affiliation, because what we're really talking about is the integrity of the vote. Yeah, I mean, Ben Swan did cover this extensively, which was an excellent report. But I mean, that's just a local Fox affiliate. How sad is it that this huge story that could determine the election down to these counties, uh, or wherever these voting machines are that Romney is invested in pretty much, or that they invested in Romney, rather. Um, how sad is it that, they'll that no media is really putting this on the front page, uh, Mark? Well, uh, Esquire has dealt with it. Uh, the Atlantic has, has dealt with it. I, I have to pull back for a moment and, and tell your, your viewers about an absolutely stunning uh, cover story in the latest issue of Harper's, the November issue, How to Rig an Election by Victoria Collier, who is a, a real stalwart election integrity activist. This is a masterpiece, this article. Uh, although it only begins to scratch the surface, it is must, it is must reading. And that piece helped push the Atlantic Esquire, the Christian Science Monitor, and other uh, considerably uh, considerable media to pay attention to this story at long last. Well, good. And quite right. To note that the national media has, as usual, shockingly enough, ignored this very important news. It's even worse than that because now, again, as we discussed last time, it's the left media that's actually uh, not just ignored this kind of story, but is is making fun of it, is debunking it. Think Progress, mm. which is you know, a questionable name in my eyes, and Alternet have now joined NBC's Chuck Todd, NBC's elections expert, in laughing off concerns about uh, election fraud through electronic means as conspiracy theory. This is just staggering to me. Uh, I, I can't really imagine why these uh, you know, self-professed left liberal outlets would, would do such a thing unless it's because they're tied to the Democratic Party. And weirdly enough, as we also discussed last time, the Democrats seem not to want to discuss this issue, I think because they believe that telling the people the truth about this kind of thing will somehow depress voter turnout. Well, that's ridiculous, is... Mark. I mean, but let's talk about, you just hit upon an extremely important point in what you just said, that the media dismisses things that are too controversial as conspiracy theory. It's a pejorative term that really just shuts down the dialogue. Talk a little bit more about this term and how it's used to manipulate um, the narrative. Yeah, well, it's, I've done a lot of research on this. Very interesting. When I came out with my book, Fooled Again, in 2005, I ran into that brick wall, conspiracy theory. Got almost no reviews, no interviews, and, I, and that's the fate that I shared with the others who've tried to tell the truth about this issue. So I looked into the history of that phrase, you know, I wanted to know when exactly was it that conspiracy theory became the cudgel of choice used by the press in this country to inhibit all discussion of inconvenient uh, stories. And to my surprise, I found that before the late 60s, the phrase was almost never used by the press in this country. It was only in the late 60s that we first started to see the media routinely use that phrase to shut down inconvenient uh, discussion. Uh, and, and it started around the Kennedy assassination. It started in response to some books that raised questions about the Warren Commission report. Now, they raised questions from various different points on the political spectrum. You know, one of these books uh, advanced the theory that Fidel Castro had Kennedy killed. Another simply raised other questions and so on. But, but it's, it's notable that that's the moment when this kind of dis dismissal began and there is a declassified CIA memo from, uh, I think it's April 1st, 1967, sent out to station chiefs worldwide uh, how to deal with the problem of these books. And, and the memo is very explicit. It says, we must use our propaganda assets and friends in the media, and that's, that's a verbatim quote, to discredit the work of these conspiracy theorists by making the following five arguments. 
some of those arguments, Abby, I hear today around any attempt to discuss election fraud. For example, well, if this were really going on, someone would have blown the We would the know about it. Yeah, exactly. Well, right. well I mean, you've also yeah. talked about something else really significant, Mark, that no one touches at all, all across the board. I mean, in really every media establishment is 9-11, alternative uh, theories about 9-11. I mean, just basically questioning the government narrative. There's so many anomalies um, that obviously don't fit into what the government tells us happened. I mean, why is this event, which is used as the premise to end this war abroad, the police state and erosion of civil liberties here at home, such a taboo subject, the brooch? I just don't understand it. And it really is the conspiracy well, theory thing that you're talking about. Well, it is. Uh, the 9-11 truth people have, have run into the same problem. And it isn't even, you know, alternative theories of what happened. It's raising any question whatsoever right, right. About, about the government's account. I mean, if you, if you note that the collapse of Building 7 is, is, was physically impossible, there's no explanation for it. That collapse wasn't even mentioned in the 9-11 Commission report. Even if you raise the question, you're, you're tarred as a conspiracy theorist, and that is a career killer for, for anybody in the press, left liberal or corporate. So uh, those people have a very good reason to, to stay mum. Now, 9-11 and election fraud, I think, are probably the most important of the stories that have been suppressed through this, through this kind of subtle intimidation. But there's really a lot of stories that over the years have been dismissed on these grounds. And they always have to do with, um, you know, uh, I suppose you could say they, they always have to do with, with the expansion of, 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 of power by the authorities, you know. Uh, the, the, the fact that the CIA was, uh, you know, involved with drug dealers and working in the inner cities, uh, Gary Webb broke that story. He was assailed all over the place as a conspiracy theorist. Uh, you know, the, the crash of Flight 800, TWA Flight 800 over the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, I could list these stories, and of course, I will sound myself like a conspiracy theorist. But one, one has to, you know, as a matter of intellectual self-respect, and I think of true patriotism, we're obliged to raise reasonable questions right. about these issues. I mean, if we care about our freedoms, as, as you implied a moment ago, we have to, we have to ask questions about 9-11 since it was used as the basis for the passage yeah, of the it, Patriot Act. It's so startling right? that no one uh, even entertains any questions. I mean, and there are so, so many questions about this. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap it up. We're out of time. I really wanted to get into so much more. We'll have you on again, Mark. Thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, definitely stay warm out there and stay dry. Okay, thanks, Abby. December event program. Yes, so let me get out of the way a little bit. Yes. Uh, yeah, go ahead and talk yes. about it. Yes, <laughs> so, so, the, so I'm with Architects and Engineers for 9-11 for Truth, the Portland chapter, and our next main event will be happening in December. It's Wednesday and Thursday, um, as you can see on the screen, Wednesday and Thursday, December 5th and 6th, and it's at, the venue is in Northeast at the Velo Cult Bar, Cycles and Bar. It's, uh, um, it's again, it's in Northeast, and um, this is our next upcoming event. On the first day, we'll be showing the video 9-11 Explosive Evidence Experts Speak Out. And on the second day, we'll be, it'll be more of a workshop. So please join us on Wednesday and Thursday, December 5th and 6th, for a two-day Civil Liberties Collaboration event, where we will explore solutions to the 9-11 to agenda and our, loss of civil, and our loss of civil liberties together. Um, and we'll be collaborating with a range of organizations, with, with a range of nonprofits. So please come. Um, and again, on the first day, we'll be showing a, a DVD, 9-11 Experts Speak Out. I'm sorry, 9-11 Explosive Evidence Experts Speak Out. And in that, in that DVD, which we'll be also handing out at the end of, of the showing, um, we'll be exploring how three skyscrapers came down on 9-11, not just two. The, the third one being Building 7, which actually came down at about 5.20 p.m. that day. And then we'll be going down bullet by bullet, showing you using the scientific method how explosives were used to bring down those buildings, all three buildings. So please join us, and it'll be educational, and it'll make you do a double take on on the entire on the well on the entire issue we, of how the towers came hope down. It does it double take? Too many people are absolutely set in their mind that they don't dare consider the possibilities, so they. You know, no matter what they hear, they say, well, 
I still don't really believe that. You know, yeah. no matter, even though they don't have a, a leg to stand on, you know, well, wh it's well, psychological and it's crippling. Mm -hmm. And one of the great things about the DVD, which is, again, entitled 9-11, Ex Explosive Evidence, Experts Speak Out, is about 15 minutes of it is dedicated to psychologists really um, um, uh, talking about how difficult it is for us to accept this information. And you know what the number easy. one video on, on my YouTube channel is? None of my shows. It's experts speak out Ex yeah, <laughs> the number one video all the you know i just post that and it all of a sudden gets a thousand or more views and it's it's very compelling oh well. really i, I guess mean that's it's a it's very compelling again it's 9 11 <laughs> explosive evidence experts speak out and it's it's about an hour and a half and it's a really a very compelling and it's the latest dvd released earlier this year in may by architects and engineers for 9 11 truth Okay, we're going to go back to another James Corbett report. This one's only five minutes long, but it's a brief history of PSYOPs. One of the things you have to do is convince people that our government will do some of these things that, you know, we're suggesting. And it turns out that we have a very, very long history. In fact, you could almost generalize, if not for certain, you could say that almost Almost every one of the conflicts that the United States is involved with anywhere in the world was started with a false flag operation, a covert, sneaky, underhanded, backstabbing against the law effort by our side or somebody hired by us so that we could have an excuse to go in and, you know, take the resources or, you know, impose or our colonial or, imperialist empire on everybody or depose somebody and impose somebody now that doesn't sound like i'm pro-american i am pro-america i just am absolutely ashamed of my government i mean it's a shame we have a, a constitution that guarantees us rights and we are not even upset when we don't honor our own rights what what does that say about us as a people we are so pitiful that we will not stand up when we are being attacked by our own country. And I'm not talking about physically attacked, I'm talking about, you know, indefinite detention, locking you up without cause or warrant, searching your house. They can now put TV cameras on your property without a warrant. Wow. That just happened. It's amazing what we're letting these folks get away with. These folks are criminals. We have to understand that what's driving this is greed. Greed is not what you can consider an acceptable human condition. It's not. It is a mental disease, and we, are, we have created a system that caters to that mental disease. It is only catering to that mental disease called greed. People that live for power and money don't even know whether the sun is up or not. I mean, that's not really an exaggeration. They have no connection to the outside world or any empathy for anybody else. And we should never allow those people to have power, ever. Yeah, so, I, mean, sometimes, I mean, in some ways we're talking about functioning psychopaths. I've got a really- High, high functioning psychopaths. You have to be a psychopath to be that. I mean, the- but, but 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 don't forget about our event in December, December fifth and sixth, which is a solution based, and and we're 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 going to be talking about the loss of our civil liberties, and you know, and because we're trying to give an outlet, you know, a local outlet, and the Portland chapter of Architects and Engineers for 9/11 Truth has been really good about trying to to collect signatures, wanting for a new investigation. We're trying to be proactive, you know. It, um, I mean, a lot of this information is really difficult, and to not just boil in your own, um, you know, upset emotions. We want to we want you to come out and. And volunteer with us and and help educate and and please join us December 5th and 6th for a solution based workshop and nobody knows it all there's so much information we can specialize like we have in the 911 uh, groups I mean yeah. we have chemists and other scientists and we have writers and we have videographers and everybody does what they can yeah. and in you know I'm doing this show which actually communicates with a lot of people who wouldn't have the, any access to this at all yeah. But let's move on. We got this five-minute clip, and this is about psyops. So let's let's let her roll. This episode of the Young Turks is brought to you by GoToMeeting. Online meetings Oops, that's, made that's not it. easy. <laughs> of, of all the things that were different here, on all the different legislation yeah, bring me that back was being here for a second. Uh, this clip here is the I don't the psyops one 
had a, a glitch in it and it won't play. We should be able to test these things ahead of time, but of course, I'm just barely making it. This is called Seat of the Pants. What this is, I'm going to take a chance. I know that this guy has given permission before, and I might just get this show ejected off of because I'm going to show this. This is the Young Turks, and this is the one I really wanted to show. I'm going to show it anyway, and I'll probably go to jail for a copyright violation, but... Well, I mean, he's given you permission before, so hopefully... Not, not giving me permission, but giving others for this, so it's not like okay. they always decline. But okay. I, we're going to go ahead and play this one. Go ahead and hook it back up, and this one, really pay attention to this. This is the one that you should hear. It's one that wasn't getting very much press attention. It was uh, what they called a Zadroga bill. It was for 9-11 responders, because they're having significant health care problems, and... Nice. Uh, you know, a lot of them have cancer, heart ailments, et cetera, at a great higher proportion than the average population. It appears obvious that they got uh, this from uh, responding to 9-11 and doing the cleanup for months on end. And honestly, almost no one was paying any attention to it. The Democrats had brought it earlier, and the Republicans killed it with a filibuster at that time. I then John Stewart, last right Friday, point. decided, you know what, or I should say last, at the end of last week on Thursday night, decided I'm, I'm going to do my last show just on this bill. I'm going to break format and talk about this. Okay? And on Friday's show here, I said, well, it was amazing uh, and that he might get people to pay attention to it. And it was, and he had the 9-11 uh, responders on the show and it was moving, etc. And then over the weekend, something amazing happened. It worked. All of a sudden, other people started talking about the bill when it seemed dead. Then all of a sudden, senators started talking about the Christmas miracle on how it might come back. And then Republicans felt like they were on the defensive and had to explain why they had killed it in the first place, which is a great question, which I'd love to ask them. They have the answers for it here. I'm going to show it to you in a second. Okay, so uh, what wound up happening? All of a sudden, Fox News picked up on it. And Fox News went on Stewart's side and said, yeah, what happened here? The first guy to do that at Fox News was Shep Smith. But he was critical because he pulled in other people like Chris Wallace. He was outraged about it and said there's no excuse for it. I want to show you the first clip here with him, but Chris Wallace is also on with him, and then that's going to spread to other parts of Fox News. Let's watch. How do they, how do they sleep at night after this vote on, uh, on Ground Zero first responders from 9-11? Are they going to get that done? Are we just going to leave these American heroes out there to twist in the wind? Well, it's a good question, and it's a, it's a national shame, the idea that, you know, the people who uh, were there were the first responders after 9-11 and have had health problems as a result, and the Congress, you know, you would think if you're going to take care of all of these other things and they were going to pass these earmarks and name buildings and post offices after people that they'd take care of some authentic American heroes. All right, then... Chris Wallace asked John Kyle on his program, hey, how come you didn't do this? John Kyle goes, oh, well, it was the cost. I'll come back to that cost issue in a second. And then it spreads to all parts of Fox News. You got Dave Briggs on Fox and Friends, Peter Johnson Jr., uh, Fox uh, News legal analyst, and then about three or four different hosts on America's news headquarters and commentators all coming out and saying, what, what, what? Of course, 9-11, what are you talking about? Yeah, we should have passed this. So where did Shep get the idea from? Did he come up with it independently? No, he admits he didn't. Go to the next clip here and he'll give John Stewart credit. We've covered this here and we've done our best to cover it and let people know that they didn't pass it and it's all political, because it is. But last night on John Stewart, it was John Stewart's last one of the week and okay, we watch it, whatever. And he's just flat on absolutely right. He says, look, I watched it on, uh, on The Daily Show and he's flat out right. Then uh, Mike Huckabee is asked about it and actually that uh, John Stewart did and he was part of the snowball effect that got this rolling. And Huckabee said, look, every Republican should vote for this bill. I wish the Republicans would say, we'll fight this battle. There ought to be 25, 35, 45 Republicans voting for it. And then Mitt Romney doesn't want to get outdone. He goes, oh, well, his guy comes out and says, oh, yeah, I'm for it, too. I don't know what these Republican senators are thinking about. Shep is not done yet. He comes back over the top. Look at how strong he comes. Final clip here from him. 
Who's going to hold these people's feet to the fire when we, you know, we're able to put a 52-story building down there so far at ground zero. We're able to pay for tax cuts for billionaires who don't need them, and it's not going to stimulate the economy. But we can't give health care to ground zero first responders who ran right into the fire, went down there to same people. Do people know what this city was like that day? People were walking over bridges. They were covered in ash. They were running for their lives. They were crying. Their family members were dead. And these people ran to ground zero to p save people's lives. And we're not going to even give them medicine for the illnesses that they got down there. It's disgusting. It's a national disgrace. It's a shame. And everybody who voted against it should, should have to stand up and account for himself or herself. Is anybody going to hold him accountable? Well, that's a good question. Well, when asked, they said to the Republican senators, why the hell did you do this? Well, John Thune first says, hey, look, we had to get the tax cuts first because the tax cuts ended on January 1st. That's a more important priority. Tax cuts for millionaires and billionaires was a higher priority, according to Senator John Thune, Republican. Okay? When they asked Senator Ensign of Nevada, he said, oh, no, no, there was a problem was the money. Well, it figures. The, you know, we had problems with the playback computer yesterday, and so I was using my own computer. Now we're having problems with my computer. And guess what? I uh, The video you well, just saw was not the one he thought you were going to see. You, you, you can go and finish that on YouTube later. But uh, as you see, we've got the live call-in number up today. We're going to take calls, and, you know, we, we might fare better answering your questions. In the meantime, here's here's the one that I really wanted you to see. This is the one that I was really talking up and this is a uh, another Russia Today. So this is, I, I might get uh, blocked on YouTube for the what I just showed, but this Russia Today one that we're about to show you is a really good one and I won't get hurt for this one. <laughs> but this one is called uh, Socialism, Rhetoric versus Reality. Now, Keep in mind that they've been calling Barack Obama a socialist. I mean, it's about the farthest thing from socialism that you could ever get is what he's doing. I mean, he is fostering the biggest wealth transfer in history. He's implementing the Wall Street ripoff of the entire world, and you call that socialism? See, that's, that's Orwellian doublespeak. It's like calling... The, what they do at the Pentagon, the Defense Department. You know, defense, it's the War Department, man. It, all they do is create war. They don't defend anything except the wealth and power of the special elite. Now, it sounds like I'm some sort of raging communist, but no, I'm an American. I want to return to constitutional law. Now, that doesn't mean that the Constitution doesn't need some work, but within the guidelines of the Constitution, it's fixable with the consent of people as long as you don't have this corrupt influence of the of the greed the mental disorder called greed that you have to have to be a politician well anyway I'm just gonna play this and then we'll come back and Marcella has more to say about the events that uh, architects and engineers is involved with but this one's socialism rhetoric versus reality <laughs> So to cut through some of this rhetoric, I'm joined now by a member of the Socialist Party and co-founder of March Forward, Mike Preisner. So Mike, you just heard this ridiculous, first of all, thank you for coming on. <laughs> you just heard this ridiculous montage of elected officials and pundits who are misusing the word socialism. So why, can you just explain to our audience really quick why Obama is not, in fact, a Marxist? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I'm a member of the PSL, that's the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Um, and of course, uh, Obama, if he actually was a socialist, uh, there would be no U.S. drones or U.S. soldiers killing people uh, in independent countries around the world. Uh, the millions of people who are unemployed would have been put to work. Uh, people would be provided health care and education free of charge. Student debt and debt mortgage payments to the banks would be immediately forgiven. Um, but I think that all of this kind of rhetoric about Obama being a socialist 
socialist, as some on the right wing will call any program that benefits any poor or working people is socialist. I think uh, as much as I dislike Obama, I have to say that a lot of the uh, claims that Obama is a socialist is right in line with the same people who say he's, uh, he's Muslim, as if that's a bad thing, or that he's not born in this country, that he's a foreigner, as if that's a bad thing. Because um, it really is part of this racist reaction uh, to someone being uh, the other in the White House or someone different. Uh, so when they're saying socialist, uh, a lot of times those people you were just playing uh, really mean uh, non-white. Uh, but the reason that this term has such a stigma and the reason that we're kind of indoctrinated with this idea uh, by this pro-corporate establishment that socialism is the worst thing ever is because that really represents uh, the only real challenge to the rule of the 1%. The only real alternative uh, to the system that we know cannot exist without inequality and without severe crises. So Mike, you're an Iraq war veteran and many people say that we're in these countries abroad uh, simply to seize their resources for profit. I mean, did your experience in Iraq guide you into embracing uh, socialism? It absolutely did. And I'm not sitting here as someone who uh, grew up as a leftist or always had this kind of radical ideology. In fact, I was completely on the other side to the point where I uh, volunteered for the US military, volunteered to go to Iraq, because I believed that uh, America was the greatest country on the planet and that we should risk our lives to defend its ideals. Uh, but I found out uh, very quickly in Iraq that all of the things that we were told, the reasons we had to go there, uh, were flat out lies. We know them today to be willful and blatant lies by the politicians that led to the death of over a million Iraqis uh, and 6,000 American soldiers. Uh, so I was very angry and betrayed by, you know, willing to give my life for this cause and then realizing that it was all a lie. And so I became obsessed with digging to find out what was the reason we went to war in Iraq, which is a question on a lot of people's minds. Um, and of course, the initial reaction was, well, it was the Bush administration and the Republican Party and Rumsfeld and Condoleezza Rice, you know, people who were warmongering uh, to benefit benefit their friends in big oil and in the defense industry. But at just a slightly closer look, you realize that since World War II, uh, when the United States emerged as the dominant superpower on the planet, a constant war against independent countries for the interests of Wall Street and the banks has been the policy of both Republicans and Democrats uh, that entire time, which is why in tonight's debate, uh, you're not going to see really any disagreement over US foreign policy about war with Iran, about war with Afghanistan, about war with Libya. There they're all going to be in line because the system itself, uh, capitalism, now in the stage of imperialism, only exists to maximize profits. That's the only thing that drives it. So inevitably, a system that is only based on maximizing profits is inevitably going to expand to seize the resources and markets of areas it does not control. If it doesn't do that, it collapses. And so today, uh, war, a constant war, is an essential feature of the capitalist system. It, it does seem like uh, this whole model is based on a system of unsustainable growth. Um, but, but Mike, you say that you know this is the only alternative to capitalism. I mean, one of the largest critiques of socialism is that if you have all your needs met and you're just given rations, it would stifle innovation and growth. I mean, is competition inherent in human nature, or is that what just what we're led to believe? I mean, how can we make sure that the incentive stays alive and people are rewarded for innovation? I think uh, that creating amazing things is in human nature. Uh, you know, this idea that socialism would stifle innovation and development. I mean, it, we're expected to believe that if every single person and young person and child in, the, child in this country was given the opportunity to pursue their dreams, to pursue what they're passionate about, uh, to go to college for whatever they want, to pursue the arts, to pursue culture, if they were given that opportunity and also had all their basic needs met so they didn't have to work worry about uh, if they were going to eat. They didn't have to worry about if they are going to be evicted. They didn't have to worry about if they are going to go bankrupt from a doctor's bill. Uh, we're expected to believe that if all these basic needs were met and all this opportunity was given to every single person in this country, all of things which can happen today with the wealth that we create in this society, we're expected to believe that that would somehow stifle innovation. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. Uh, what stifles innovation is this system that says millions of young people cannot go to college simply because they cannot afford it. Sure, that but, they're rewarded, people who but they're rewarded for, for innovation. I mean, would there, would there be any sort of rewards for these people pursuing innovation? 
I think the reward of uh, actually creating things and giving back to society is one that, that will entice people. Um, I don't think that the majority of people who become artists or who become scientists or who become doctors uh, are doing so because they want to make money, but because they truly feel that these are things they want to pursue and develop. Uh, but right now, under this system, people do not have the opportunity to do those things. Only a small, privileged sector can pursue all those things that I just mentioned, uh, while really the majority, millions and millions of people in this country, uh, do not have those opportunities. And so I think a society that's based on equality and allowing every single person to go to college and pursue the things that they love and are passionate about, that will result in, in much more well, human potential. Mike, I think uh, definitely with the, in light of the Occupy Wall Street movement, definitely uh, primarily rallying against the system of capitalism. Definitely something to think about. Thank you so much for coming on, sharing your Thank take, you. Mike Preisner. We're back. Yeah, now, the problem with, with talking about stuff like that is that people start putting up these mental blocks. Oh, we're talking to a socialist. We're listening to a socialist. Oh, take him away, take him away. I don't care. What do you, wait a minute. Free education? Our needs are met? Oh, you mean all the anxiety from your life would be gone, allowing you to concentrate on what you really have as a passion? Like, if you're a chemist or some other scientist or maybe it's art maybe it's literature but you get to concentrate all of your intellect on that without having to worry about you know where your next nickel's coming from and how do you do that by preventing the greed from concentrating the wealth in bank accounts that you never get to see you know what kind of nonsense is it if you were starting out a civilization and you had a, a certain number of, of people do you think you could get away with suggesting to him, hey, I got an idea, I got an idea. Here's a system that everybody will concentrate all their wealth, they'll give up everything they make for the benefit of the top half percent of that group. Now, that's a great idea. That, we can sell that to everybody, couldn't we? If you had to sell capitalism to somebody that didn't have it, you would walk out of there with egg on your face. You could not sell capitalism to anybody who was healthy and sane. You, you could sell it easily to the sick people that have greed in their bones. Well, anyway, okay, I guess you see where I'm coming from. And I, I hate it when people start calling you communists or socialists, because if you listen to the rhetoric, you'll see that they interchange those words all the time, communist, socialist, Marxist, and what they really mean is the totalitarian governments that we've seen as examples. Now, we've never had a communist... The color. Uh, we've never had a, a real communist economy on this planet. We've we've had some things that are socialist, but they've all been corrupted, and they point to the corruption, and that's not part of cap, uh, not part of socialism. It's not part of communism, and it shouldn't be part of capitalism. If you you know, but anyway, we've got a call. We might as well go to him. So, hello, caller. Hello, caller. Hello, caller. Well, I guess we lost our caller. I don't know. Um, okay, well, um, okay, well, um, as we wait our, our next caller, as we await our next caller, yeah, I, I, an update. I, yeah, I just want to remind, I'm with the Portland chapter of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. We have another caller. If the caller wants to say something. Put them through, and, and as soon as we hear them, we'll talk. <laughs> yeah, as soon as we hear him, we'll talk. Um, uh, we're always in limbo, waiting for the caller that never shows up sometimes. Well, just go ahead and... But um, I'm with the Portland chapter of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And um, our next our next main event is going to be in December. December, Monday and Thursday... Oh, sorry. Wednesday and Thursday, December 5th and 6th in the evening from 7 to 930 and it's going to be in, in Northeast Portland at the Velo Cult Cycles and Bar. Please go to our website, www.portlandae911truth.org, for the location and times. It's going to be a Civil Liberties First um, Expert Speak Out Solutions Workshop. And please join us on Wednesday and Thursday, December 5th and 6th, for the two-day Civil Liberties Collaboration event, where we'll be discussing um, the loss of our civil liberties and, explore, and exploring solutions to the 9-11 agenda. It's it's a proactive approach to 
to the issue of the three skyscrapers falling on 9-11. Do we have a caller? Yeah, do we have a caller? Well, um, while we're waiting for a caller, uh, do we have a caller? <laughs> Okay, well, I guess we do have a caller, but we're, um, well, um, so I said that our next major event is going to be in December, December 5th and 6th, but next year, the Architects and Engineers for 11 Truth Portland chapter is hoping to have David Ray Griffin, um, we're thinking maybe February, March, and then the founder of Architects and Engineers for 11 Truth, Richard Gage, possibly in May. So these have been, uh, caller, if you're on the line, please, please. Please say something. They're probably um, talking, saying hello, hello, hello. Okay, but well, sorry if we can't hear you, and you are saying something. Until we can hear something. Um, yeah, well, next year, yeah, we're hoping to have David Ray Griffin, um, who actually, David Ray Griffin, um, he has about, gosh, about 11 books on, on the 9-11 topic. I, I just heard him interview, the, well, it, it might have been an older interview, so I could be wrong, but he counted eight books, and then nine if you count the little Bin Laden book. And oh, nice. the, the interviewer said, yes, of course. And he said, well, thank you. So it was nine. But he might might have written two more. I've forgotten. He's in kind of a controversy. And uh, some of the 9-11 groups are criticizing him. And, and Architects for 9-11 Truth is one of those where they, for the uh, telephone, uh, the call theory, they, they disagree with that, that there were no calls. They think that that's something that will block people from, uh, you know, trusting any of the alternative 9-11 stories because um, it was so widespread that Barbara Olson called Ted Olson and told him about the box cutters. That's where that box cutter story started. But the FBI report showed that she attempted one call. Uh, the, her husband said that she had tried, that she called twice, and the second time was for three or four minutes. We hear the caller, but it's kind of distorted. But it turns out that uh, the FBI reported that she only tr attempted one call, not completed zero seconds. So the FBI says that there wasn't a call. I, I don't blame you for hanging up, caller. <laughs> I'm not hanging up. I haven't hanging up. There you I'm are. not hanging up. Okay, you're in here. We got you Hi. this time. Say what you, Go ahead before we hey. lose you. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to say that I was glad that somebody was showing this. Um, that I've done my own research and come to the same conclusion that I believe 9-11 was an inside job. Um, I'm, I'm very suspicious of the money that was taking, taken out of the vault and the gold that was gone. Um, so yeah, I don't like think I'm you're crazy. <laughs> I don't think you're crazy or anything, but I get the same response whenever I try to talk to individuals. I think it's, I hope that other people are watching this so that they can see this information, um, but I think it's sad that a lot of people won't be watching. I think it's sad that a lot of people, Americans, won't care, and if you say something like this, they'll think that we're conspiracists or that we're un-American if we, you know, doubt, and yet at the same breath, I'll hear um, people, mostly conservative, um, dead set Republicans, griping and moaning about their government. But at the same time, if you mention something like this, they don't believe the government would do anything like that. And turn it people down are so busy looking at the government that they don't try to see the powers that are running our government in both parties. Well, you know, in the past, I used to kind of, I don't know, it, it, the intimidation of being called a, a nutcase or conspiracy nut or have people just kind of look away and smile and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, when they do that, you say, hey, wait a minute, you don't get to dismiss that that easily. Conspiracy theorist is now a badge of honor because what we've been saying for years is now absolutely in your face. Right. You know, it's, I, I'm. I like to think it as conspiracy facts. Right. Um, so. I just tell them to do the research. If yeah. they do the yeah. research, yeah. then they will see for themselves. But too, sadly, a lot of people won't even try that far. I don't. I'm not sure why, because I see a lot of distrust in the government, and yet it, they don't seem to see it that far. They don't believe that the terrorists that we've been told about are here. Well, here's and alive what here's what well. I listen to this. Here's what I did when somebody you know started saying I was a conspiracy theorist, 
And my next question to them right away was, oh, then you don't believe that 9-11 was a conspiracy. And they say, of course I don't. And I said, oh, I thought you supported the government theory. Well, I do. I said, well, make up your mind. Mm -hmm. do, do, it, the government's theory is that there was a conspiracy of 19 Arabs plus bin Laden. That's a conspiracy theory. Now, do you believe in conspiracy theories or not? Oh, it's your choice of which one. Interesting, interesting. It's anyway, so, and but, then tell them to, you know, back up your, we, there's been no evidence whatsoever to support the government's theory. And everything we say, we can show you some evidence for. So which right. theory are you going to go for? You know, that's it. it. It was very compelling to me because you had, what I had come up with was uh, people that had been, their stories of having been re first responders, uh, testimony from doctors, um, uh, uh, people that uh, talked about the way the explosions made the buildings come down and uh, people not even talking about the third building that went down. I mean, and the firefighters on the scene. I mean, there's firefighters, there's family members. It was all a little too compelling to just uh, swallow the propaganda that um, the government or the main media want you to believe. And um, Well, here's one. You know, they, they always say to you, well, if this was true, you know, there would have been so many people that knew and they wouldn't have been able to keep it quiet. And... You, you turn you turn that around and say, well, now wait a minute. Are you saying that all these people that we're telling you about, they must be conspiracy nuts, where they all conspired to create a lie about 9/11 because they hate America just like the Arabs, right? I mean, it's it's ridiculous when you analyze what they're trying to say. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. we should it should all make us very kind of afraid that this could happen because. Uh, you know, I've heard why these things had happened for the greed and power, and they um, were spotting certain people that were maybe getting ready to uncover or investigating certain <laughs> things that were happening. So it should make us um, scared enough to become involved and pay attention because it could happen to any of us. Well, everything we've been talking about, you know, uh, the, the way America is changing so severely they right. could not have done it without this terrorism fear. You know, they had they needed a boogeyman, and that's what they created with 9/11. And that mm -hmm. boogeyman is to replace the the Cold War, to replace the Hot War, to replace the war against terror. The war, I mean, the war against drugs. The war, you know, all these phony wars that they concentrate the wealth and power with. You know, are directly a result of cheating. DC, yeah, and to divert lying. the American attention away mm. from something and create chaos we, so they can do <laughs> this this power and greed thing. So we got I a minute wanted, left. <laughs> I just wanted to kind of say that I was uh, glad to see this um, at least trying to be um, talked about or, uh, or at least some education to the public. And I, I wish so bad that people could kind of open up their minds and at least look at the information rather than... I, I don't know why it's so push aside because there's so much other crazier stuff out there. You know, this at least it makes sense if you start looking into it. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, well, well <laughs> thanks a lot. Birth and certificates to Muslims. If you want to put the, together a, pre, a presentation, I'll let you put it on my show too. Think about that. <laughs> We've got 39 seconds left, and I want to say that on my next show, I'll try to present a list of whistleblowers. I can talk really fast, and I wouldn't get done in an hour with all the whistleblowers there are. So, uh, yeah, the, the, I'm just an individual. I mean, uh, that just uh, did the research myself. Just kind of looked into it yeah. and saw that there was enough. So d enough don't forget to go to our there. website, uh, PortlandAE911Truth.org. We're 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 gone in 15 seconds. So yeah. PortlandAE911Truth.org for for the December events that we're going to be having December 5th and 6th. Please join us for a solution-based workshop. Next show on the 17th. Next show on the 17th. <laughs> See you in two weeks. PortlandAE911Truth.org. <laughs> Look at that, we got multiple pictures up there. <laughs>